fellow students, uh, welcome to Mount Kenya University televised classes. Today we are going to have uh, a unit in uh, labor economics. Uh, our unit code is uh, BBM 3102, labor economics. Uh, your unit lecturer for this semester is going to be CHRPK Kadrin Nguli. Uh, this unit is a unit serviced from uh, the Department of Management, School of Economics, uh, School, School of Business and Economics. Uh, as a way of uh, introduction, uh, I want to believe that you have been taught very many uh, units uh, in economics. I'm very sure that when you were in first year, first semester or second semester, you are taught an, a, a unit in uh, introduction to micro uh, economics. You went further, you were taught uh, another unit from the Department of Economics introduction to macro economics. As you advanced in the years of your study here at our university, you were also taught uh, a unit in uh, intermediate micro economics and intermediate macro economics. Those units are specifically tailored uh, in the Department of uh, Economics in the School of Business. But now we are diverging from uh, that a bit to uh, narrow down to uh, those students who are taking uh, a management course and specializing in uh, human resource management. And then we ask ourselves, uh, why the unit labor, labor, labor economics. Uh, remember, uh, we were taught a unit in human resource management and all the units which are in that uh, human resource management, uh, we find that we are always talking about employees. We are talking about labor. We know that uh, the human capital or rather the employees uh, of any organizations are the ones which sell their labor and uh, when I'm talking about labor, I do, not even, uh, I do not mean the physical labor. I'm talking about their knowledge. I'm talking about their skills. I'm talking about their talent, their expertise, and even their attitude. Because to perform some jobs, you need a positive attitude so that you can be able uh, to work well. So uh, human resource management is all about uh, taking care of all the employment um, uh, employment concerns or employment concerns of employees from the time they show interest in joining an organization up to the time even to the time they retire and beyond because uh, we also talk about their pensions and all that. So uh, when you are talking about labor economics, we really know that organizations do not have money to draw away to employees. Organizations want to pay for performance. Uh, organizations really want to minimize cost and not at the expense of uh, performance. So in labor economics, you are trying to see the best way or now to save on cost, yet maximizing on productivity. Uh, as a way of uh, definition, uh, we are saying that labor economics can be defined as the study of the workings and the outcomes of the market for labor. So uh, in this unit, we are not talking about now selling of products. No, here, the product which we are talking about here uh, is now the employees. We are going to be talking about employees but not other products. And we want to see how the relationship between the employers, yeah, the employees, the undertakings, the work environment, the government policies, how can all these be utilized to make sure that there is a win-win uh, approach whereby an organization maximizes on productivity and also uh, profit, and on the other side, employees are uh, maximized on uh, utility. Uh, we know that um, the reasons why organizations are instituted is to maximize on profit, yeah? How do they maximize on uh, profit? We know that organizations by themselves cannot do that, but they 
bring on board employees who now help the organization uh, to achieve uh, their objectives. So labor economics can be defined as the study of the workings, as I have explained, and the outcomes of the market for labor. Yeah? We sell labor as employees to our organization. What actually employees pay as wages for is not us as individuals, but it is what we invest uh, in those organizations in terms of our competences, our knowledge, our work experience, uh, ETC. And as we continue uh, deeper into this unit, we are going to see actually it is that which we invest in ourselves which make employee Y earn a different salary from an employee K even though they are working uh, in the same organization. So um, uh, labor economics is concerned with the behavior of employers and employees in response to the general incentives of wages. I've just talked about, uh, uh, you know, the salaries, the profits, uh, the prices, the non-profit aspects of employment relationship, such as the working environment. We know for employees to work very well, for them to deliver, definitely the employer has to provide a conducive working environment so that the employee can feel that uh, he has no reason not to perform as expected or to eat the targets which have been set uh, for them. And uh, this uh, definition uh, which we have talked about um, was uh, coined by uh, a scholar called Moredi Oktara. As we continue still uh, with uh, labor economics, we really need to ask ourselves, fine, we are saying that uh, we are talking about uh, the behavior of employees. Like, for example, we know that uh, employees, when they feel that they have not been compensated or rewarded as required, they go on strike because uh, they want to be, uh, maybe, or they use their trade unions so that uh, they can have their salaries hiked. So we really need to know now why should we study this unit, labor economics, as we prepare as being potential human resource managers uh, in the near future, because I know most of us uh, are in third or fourth year. So what is the purpose of this unit? Uh, the purpose of the unit labor economics is uh, to help the learners to acquire knowledge for designing the labor market. So when you are talking about the labor market, you are talking about organizations who are out there looking for people who have got what it takes to take their organization to the next level in terms of performance, in terms of uh, productivity, yeah? in terms of even uh, being unique compared to other organizations. So we are asking ourselves, how can we use the knowledge from labor economics to be able to motivate uh, these employees so that they can help our organization to achieve a market niche as we also try to cut it down on cost. So uh, what are the learning outcomes of uh, this course? So uh, by the end uh, of this unit, we are expected number one, learning outcome number one, to discuss aspects and the determinants of uh, labor demand. What, like for example, uh, determines or what informs the organization that it requires to add more labor. Adding more labor is having, bringing on board uh, new employees. And uh, some of these ones, even before we are taught, we already know the determinants of labor demand. Like for example, when uh, we check our organization, using the knowledge we used <coughs> in uh, human uh, resource management whereby we talked about a job analysis whereby uh, we collect all the information required about a certain job, we may be able to identify that there is a certain gap. And after we identify that there is a certain gap, we also collect all the information required to fill that gap. Like for example, the academic qualification uh, you know, the job experience, 
uh, issues to do with uh, maybe professional qualifications, uh, ETC. The other determinant of labor demand is you may find that an organization has a gap, fine, but at the moment it is training financially, so it is not able, it is not able to bring on a new employee um, at the moment. So financial muscle of an organization to pay can be able to inform uh, whether the organization can bring on board new employees at the moment or it can wait. And uh, we also have other alternatives like, for example, uh, uh, when we find that an organization is straining uh, financially, uh, most organizations decide now to make some employees more skill or more tax or uh, maybe uh, give a responsibility and uh, pay responsibility allowance to that employee other than bringing a new employee on board because a new employee will attract all the other allowances required for a full-time employee. But if uh, we give a responsibility to one of the existing employees, then uh, what we will do then will only require to pay that employee an increment in terms of uh, responsibility allowance, and then that way we bring down um, cost. So that is just one of them because uh, the major aim of uh, this lesson is uh, maybe to shed light on what you are going to be covering for the rest of the semester. Then after that, uh, in the coming classes, we are going uh, to be tackling each objective or a chapter at a time so that we sink deeper so that we understand. The others are to the next objective is um, to discuss aspects and the determinants of labor supply. To discuss aspects and the determinants of labor uh, supply. Uh, it is the organization which demands labor from the labor market, but now when it comes to the labor supply, it is now uh, the labor market which supplies the labor to the organization. And uh, as we are going to look at uh, the determinants of the labor supply, at times it depends on, like for example now, the saturation of that kind of uh, labor in the market. Because when we are looking for labor, we also look at the cost. Like for example, you find that when there is a specific kind of labor which is saturated at the market, you find that its cost is cheap because it is in plenty in the labor market. But when uh, the supply of labor is scarce, like for example, when you are talking of uh, like the neurosurgeons, when you are talking about pilots, yeah, uh, you'll find that uh, their cost uh, is high or their wages are high because we have got a uh, low supply of such kind of uh, labor uh, in the market. At times when we are talking about the determinants of uh, labor supply, we also look at uh, the education levels uh, of people uh, who are our potential employees, among others. The number three, we are going to, uh, an, a learning outcome number three is to describe the role of education as a signaling device or a signal device for labor. Um, when we look at uh, the labor market, when we look at the human resources, these are the, these are the employees who are working in organization. We know that uh, they did, did not uh, just grow up and then found themselves uh, in their jobs which they are holding now. You will find that uh, these uh, employees who are currently working now in our organizations were prepared to be where they are, to be in the offices where they are working to be performing the duties where, uh, which they are performing in the organization, they were prepared through an education system. Yeah? Like, uh, for example, we know we have got uh, the very early education which starts from home, then we go uh, to the kindergartens through primary, through secondary, university, then we work. We also find that even when we are working, we find that uh, we do not have the sufficient skills then uh, we go for refresher courses whereby our skills are sharpened. Yeah, so uh, we are going to 
talk about that. Uh, and uh, for the purposes of this class, I'm going to, uh, you know, get deeper in the role of education as a signaling device as we move ahead. The other one is we cannot really talk about labor economics without talking about the trade unions. The trade unions. What are trade unions? We know that trade unions are organizations which are formed by employees who are working in a certain uh, field. Like, for example, we have the KNUT, the Kenya National Union of Teachers, which is a trade union for uh, the teachers. We also have uh, the WASU the University Academic uh, Staff Union. Uh, these are trade unions which fight for the rights of their members. And uh, the members uh, of WASU, we know that uh, these are the university lecturers. And we know most of uh, the key, especially the key uh, points which uh, these trade unions operate uh, to fight for fair salaries, uh, for their employees, better working environment, better housing, better training, um, ETC. The fifth uh, expected learning outcome is that uh, we are supposed to understand such employment and unemployment. Uh, most of the times uh, we find that um, we say that there is a lot of unemployment in Kenya, though I usually tend to differ with that uh, because uh, I want to believe that uh, there are still very many jobs in Kenya. The reason why we say that there are no jobs in Kenya is only that uh, those jobs have changed their color from white to blue. Yeah? We are always looking for white collar jobs, especially as university students. I know behind the mind of each one of us as students, we are looking forward to graduate and get very good jobs, white collar jobs, of course. And then we are finding that uh, the competition for the white collar jobs is very high because most Kenyans and uh, even the world all over, you'll find that people have really gone back to school not once, not twice or thrice. People have got uh, their first degree, their diplomas, their masters, their PhDs. So you know, uh, you need to be very competitive in terms of experience and also knowledge uh, for you to be able to get a job. But you can easily start your blue uh, collar job uh, easily from even, you know, from your talent, yeah, from talent or even borrowing from your previous job, the skills you have been using from your employer and uh, you start a job. So uh, when we are going to be looking at uh, search and unemployment, uh, when we are talking about an um, unemployment, because this is a topic uh, on its own in labor economics, uh, we should be very careful to define what unemployment is, because there are those people who decide not to work by choice. They have what it takes, they have the time, they have their competence, they have their experience, they have their knowledge, but they decide not to work. So when we are counting those people who are unemployed, we do not count those ones to be unemployed because they are unemployed by choice. They have decided uh, not to work. We will also find that there are different forms of unemployment. Yeah? Like for example, we know we have got seasonal unemployment, uh, whereby we talk like those people who are working in the hospitality industry, uh, especially in Mombasa or in the agribusiness, whereby we have uh, peak seasons, like the harvest season in the agribusiness, and we also have uh, the low season, whereby um, the employer does not really require many employees. Then uh, the last uh, expected learning outcome uh, is on, uh, we need to understand what are the current issues facing labor economics in our organizations today. Now, uh, we need to understand each and every chapter we are going to be covering uh, this uh, semester. And uh, chapter one, I have uh, explained a bit on uh, the overview of the labor market. 
Yeah. And we said the labor market is whereby we are talking about employees or potential employees seeking for jobs yeah, at uh, a good wage. And we are also looking at uh, a scenario whereby we have organizations or employers who are looking for people to bring on board to help them achieve uh, their objectives. Um, So uh, as we study more on uh, the labor uh, economics, we are saying that labor economics can be studied uh, or conducted at two very important levels. And the first one is what we call the positive economics. Positive economics, and as we study in our organizations, it is very important to understand uh, positive economics. And uh, positive economics uh, in the economic theory analyzes what is. What is the situation in our organization? Like for example now, when we are talking about now our uh, human capital, our employees, what is the situation now? What is our situation now? Are we okay with the number of employees uh, who we are having because we said organizations really work hard with the help of the unit labor economics or the knowledge from labor economics to cut down on cost. So we need to find out what is the situation now. Have we overemployed so that we make a decision to downsize? Yeah. Are we having some employees whose skills and competencies have been rendered redundant? Those competences are no longer useful to the organization. So that now we do away uh, with them because probably their skills have been replaced by technology. For example, we know that uh, we saw uh, a lot of redundancy in our banks when uh, the tellers, uh, the people who are working in the on, on the tellers were replaced by, uh, you know, the online banking and also uh, the ATM machines. So we saw so many employees being shown the door because whatever they were doing was replaced by machines. So we are saying that labor economics will help us to know what is the situation currently yeah, uh, in our organization. And this one is going to be done uh, through uh, what we are referring to as uh, positive economics. And this is to explain people's behavior. This is a theory of behavior in which people are assumed to respond favorably to benefits and negative to cost. And this can be likened to the Skinner. Skinner, you know, we talk about uh, 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 FK Skinner, whereby we talk about um, people benefiting to positive things which are making them uh, better, feel better. Uh, we know the experiment which was conducted by F. Skinner, whereby uh, the use of uh, the salivating of the dog, and the dog had been uh, as ca accustomed to, uh, not a, uh, you know, he used uh, what we called, uh, Skinner used a rat, uh, he used a lever, uh, he used some uh, food pellets, and uh, every time uh, the rat uh, climbed on the lever, some food pellets would fall on the other side, and uh, the rat would rush, nib on the pellets, and because it was rewarded because of uh, climbing on the lever, uh, you found that um, it, would, it kept on uh, climbing on the lever, climbing on the lever, pellets falling on the other side until it had enough. So uh, Skinner also decided to find out whether we can still use the same experiment uh, to discourage, to discourage uh, the rat from uh, climbing on the, uh, on the lever. This is by using a uh, negative uh, reward. So he removed the food pellets, introduced electric uh, shock on the lever. So when the rat climbed on uh, the lever, uh, you find that it could not get food from the other side because it had been removed and it could be eat by the electric shock. So after a lot of pain uh, when climbing on the lever, not getting food from the other side, uh, 
the rat stopped climbing on the lever. So in labor economics, we are told that uh, we can use motivation to motivate employees to work beyond the mechanical call of uh, duty. And on the reverse, we can use punishments. Like, for example, when people come late for work for several days, uh, then uh, the number of hours or the days they have been away from work without uh, permission, uh, that, uh, those hours are deducted from their salaries. That is going to be a negative reward which will discourage them from uh, failing to come to work. Another um, level of labor economics is what we call the normative economics. Positive economics, we said, what is the situation in our organization now in terms of employees, in terms of performance, in terms of production. And now when we go to normative economics, it's all about what should be, what should be, yeah? And uh, what should be realistically would be the employees help the organization achieve their objectives and also... Uh, the organization also help the employees to be able to achieve their objectives because both of their objectives are uh, to fulfill. So we are saying that normative economics is used to judge what should be. Understanding normative economics begins with the realization that there are two kinds of economics transactions whereby one is entered into voluntarily because we are both benefiting whereby the employer uh, who is uh, buying labor from employees is benefiting from uh, the stock of knowledge skills and competences from an employee and the employee is benefiting on the other side because is paid salary equal to their knowledge experience performance uh, so that whatever they are getting will be able to help them be able to meet uh, their needs and wants. And this is especially why you find that uh, employees keep on moving from one organization to another. This is whereby you find that uh, the employee finds that they are not being compensated enough uh, compared to their stocks of knowledge, skills, talent uh, ETC. So we are saying uh, the main objective or role of the labor market is to facilitate those voluntary, mutually and advantageous transactions whereby the employer is gaining and uh, the employee uh, is also uh, gaining. Uh, I want us now uh, to look at uh, labor markets and uh, ask ourselves, why do sometimes labor markets fail? Because all the times labor markets do not succeed, at times they fail. And remember we are saying, when we are talking about labor markets, not like we are talking about the market of goods. We are talking about now uh, the market for labor, whereby we sell our skills, we sell our competences, we sell our talent. Uh, in exchange of a wage. So the reason why uh, labor markets fail, one, is because of ignorance. Yeah? At times, uh, we may not be having uh, information as employees of where to sell, of where to sell our skills, where to sell our competence, where to sell our talent. Markets are there but we do not know where they are. And that is one of the reasons why most of us are staying jobless because we lack knowledge where jobs are. So uh, ignorance is one of the reasons which may make our uh, labor markets to fail. You may be finding that uh, you are really desperate for a job. There is an organization somewhere which is very desperate for your skills and services but you do not have knowledge of that. Either you have ignored uh, maybe um, doing uh, research 
applying uh, for such jobs and even knowing where your skills are required at a certain moment because not all the time your skills will be required uh, in all organizations. Then uh, the other reason why organizations, uh, why labor markets fail is because of transaction barriers. Transaction barriers. Uh, you know, uh, there has to be a mutual agreement between um, the person selling the labor or the employee and uh, the employer. At times, Employees, depending on those with the rare skills, as I've talked about, uh, like for example, you know, uh, the surgeons, the pilots, the engineers, um, they may find that because the availability is very scarce in the market, you may find that they may charge uh, their services very highly and the employer uh, to be does not have the financial muscle, it's not able to afford that or uh, they disagree uh, on a few things. They are not able to read from the same script. That is going to lead to uh, transaction barriers. We also have price distortions for labor, whereby uh, you, find that, uh, you may find that you are working, you have the same academic qualification with somebody. You have the same academic qualification with somebody working in a different organization, but you are being paid uh, different salaries. Yeah? Like for example, you know that those who are working in towns and those who are working in remote areas with the same uh, academic qualifications, depending on the location, they may not be paid the same. You may find that there will be price distortions. And then we are also talking about non-existence of market being uh, a reason which may lead to market failures, non-existence of market. Like for example, uh, you may have invested in yourself in some kind of uh, rare labor which uh, people are not used to, which is new in the market. And you need to create a market first to teach people on what you do what they need to benefit from your labor for them uh, to be able uh, to be interested uh, in buying your labor. So before you create that market, before you create that awareness, you will find that uh, you may lack, you may lack uh, a market. Uh, I wish to move to a topic on human capital a topic on human capital, which is one of the chapters uh, in Labor Economics Unit. Uh, when you are talking about human capital, as I said, what organizations buy from us as employees is the stocks of knowledge, the expertise and competences which we have invested uh, in ourselves. That is what they buy. They don't buy us, they, they do not buy uh, or they do not just bring people on board. They bring specific stocks of knowledge, uh, experience, and such to the organization. So uh, first, we need, we have just defined what human capital is, stocks of knowledge which people, knowledge, skills, uh, expertise, experience which uh, we as uh, employees invest in ourselves. What are the uses of human capital? We could not be talking about organizations if we do not have this human capital. Yeah? We need to have people who are experienced to be able to be brought on board to our organizations, to take our organization to the next level in terms of performance, to always instill new knowledge, new experience, new talent, so that we are able to beat the market uh, competition. So. We use uh, the human capital expertise to be able to help organization to achieve their objectives in terms of productivity, yeah? in terms of being unique, in terms of uh, profitability, in terms of business growth, 
and uh, you know, in terms of even uh, driving our organization to the next level, in terms of uh, leadership acumen, among uh, other points. So we are asking ourselves now, how do these uh, people uh, get prepared to acquire uh, these stocks of knowledge uh, which we are talking about? Yeah? And I have said that um, we, uh, we, we, are not, uh, we are not at uh, one particular point ready uh, to, get, uh, to fit into our organizations to work. But we are prepared through several stages. Like, for example, we know that uh, we have got uh, the age from zero to around uh, 14 years. Uh, whereby we have the ages when we are, where we are at home, whereby we are taught language, yeah? Because we are not taught language at work or even at primary. We know that we are taught language uh, from home. Basic arithmetic, we are taught from home. Uh, basic etiquette, we are taught from home. Uh, you know, and uh, basic training, like for example, uh, basic math, counting, uh, the alphabet, etc., and all these are, are all stages whereby we are trained step by step to be able to join uh, the job market. And that is why by the time we are clearing our primary school, we may, not be very much, we may not be very much sure of who we want to be when we start working. Yeah? But um, after we join secondary school, uh, depending on how we are nurtured, uh, Depending on uh, even the career guidance we are given, and depending also on our performance in specific subjects, we are now able now to shape somehow where we want to be uh, in the near future. And you know, like for example, if you want to be an engineer in secondary, you are supposed, like for example now, to be able now to take the three sciences uh, and perform them very well not just uh, being able to choose the three sciences and math, but be able to perform them uh, very well. So that is where now our job and uh, career paths start to be shaped. And that is why when now we are choosing courses to go to study at the university, we already know where we want to be. We already know what we want to be. And that is why at times when we are taken... Uh, when we are admitted to take some courses, we revise them because we find that they are not in our line uh, which we want to pursue. Uh, so that is how now uh, we invest in ourselves in terms of uh, education. After we graduate, even before we graduate, uh, we are prepared for the job market. I know some of us are already having their attachment uh, placement agency letters to proceed for attachment um, next uh, semester. That is a way of preparing you for the job market. You get the initial skills. You get to interact with the job market whereby you are working under an immediate supervisor who shows you, like for example now for I know all of us are taking human resource, you will be attached in a human resource office and you will be able to know the roles of a human resource department. What are the roles of a human resource manager? And you are going to be assigned duties. You are going to be assigned duties uh, in the office of the human resource manager so that you are not going to be very green when uh, you start scouting uh, for a job. And this is whereby now you learn through doing on the job training. Yeah? You are learning through performing that particular job. Yeah? So that uh, when you go now for interviews, you will not only say that uh, you have a first class honors in a uh, Bachelor of Business Management, Human Resource Option, but you will also be able to showcase, like for example, your recommendation letter from an organization like BDCO where you went for your industrial placement, whereby uh, you are now on the job training, all performance can be gauged. That is why it is usually very important when we go for industrial attachment to request for a recommendation letter 
when we are done uh, with the exercise. So uh, we, here we are talking about education and training. Yeah, remember as we prepare our human capital, there are some two sets of preparations which we are supposed to be very uh, keen on. One is the academic preparation, the one which we are doing. We are instilling, you, we are instilling in you the first initial skills to enable you to perform the job. Yes. So uh, after you go out there, you require some technical training which is going to be more of job related other than academic related. So as we prepare ourselves as the stocks of uh, human capital, uh, before or immediately we are done with our degree and we get to the job uh, market, it is important also to equip ourselves with the professional skills. We need to equip ourselves with the professional skills which show us uh, or which train us in being more of a job uh, oriented trained than only being a pure uh, theory trained students because uh, we need to blend the two to help our organization get to the next level and we know that uh, even after we are employed we get the promotions we should open our eyes uh, to search for other new opportunities because there are always new stocks of knowledge. There are always uh, new uh, stocks of uh, talent, expertise, technology, etc. And for us to remain relevant in the job market, we need to prepare ourselves to be fit in the job market. We need to look around for anything which can block us. Uh, from uh, getting a job and others not getting a job where others are getting. And I've really emphasized on making sure that uh, we get the professional qualifications, especially for us who are preparing to be human resource managers. We train uh, ourselves or rather we enroll with the human resource professional examination board the HRM PEB and uh, register for certification uh, course so that we will always be competitive when we go for interviews um, with uh, our other competitors. Uh, from there, we find that um, as we earn, because I remember when I started, I said that we could be working in the same organization but earning different uh, salaries. What makes us earn different salaries? And um, we, we are going to be uh, looking at that as we move on. I have a diagram there on uh, population and human capital so that uh, we understand very well. And I have divided uh, that uh, human uh, capital into three depending on the way it is prepared uh, to join the labor market. I have explained, this is what I have explained, 0 to 24 years. Uh, we are calling uh, this uh, red part, uh, we are calling it the dependent population and uh, the age is 0 to 24 years, dependent population, because uh, this is the age whereby we are very young, uh, all our needs are met by the parents, food, clothing, shelter, education, everything, security, whatever you're talking about. And by the age of 24, around 22, 24 years, this is now when we are leaving the, we are leaving the university to go and join uh, the job market. So, uh, from there, we join the job market and uh, there we get into another strata which we are calling the uh, independent population. This is an independent population because these are people now who have joined the job market. They are working. Uh, it is around um, the ages of like uh, 24 to 30 uh, whereby you find that other people start their own families. 
This is the time whereby they start building their own houses without even having to involve their parents. Others are going back for masters without involving their parents because they are earning and they are able to pay for their fees. Uh, you'll also find that um, uh, these people are able to even support the people who are below them. We are having, like for example now, people who are under the dependent population supporting their dependents, uh, sorry, their siblings who are under the 0 to 24 through paying fees, uh, maybe house rent, medication, education, etc. And uh, up here, here at uh, the independent population, we are also able to take ourselves back to school because we are able to afford. We are getting good salaries, we are getting promoted. Yeah? In the evening, we are able to go and add more classes because we know that after we are able to increase on our education, improve on our education, uh, we are rewarded through promotions. At times, we even start our own companies, etc. And then we also have another group here of uh, the dependent population. Dependent population as in, after we retire, and that is why I'm talking about the age of 65 years plus. And this is whereby uh, you find that uh, the retirement age in Kenya now is 60. Yeah? So by the time we are retiring, Remember, we we'll only have a uh, pension, which is uh, can barely sustain us. And now we start now depending, depending now on our children, on our relatives for upkeep. Yeah, uh, medication, housing, food, maybe shelter, uh, etc. So that is why we are saying that uh, this middle group of the independent population is very important because we have got two groups of population depending on it. So we should really try to invest in ourselves as much um, as possible. So this is now how we also prepare. Yeah, here we get the basic knowledge up to maybe the university. As we work we go and start our maybe masters in line of our work, our duties, and then uh, our training here at this level of the independent population is more tailor-made to our career, to improve uh, our career. Then we've talked about the dependent population when we retire, and maybe we are weak to be able now to support ourselves economically. Then now we look at uh, sources of human capital differences. Sources of human capital differences. Uh, why do different employees perform differently? Others are very good, excellent performers. Others are in the middle. And others are just there. What could be leading to all that? And number one, you are saying probably we are performing the way we perform at our work and even academically, because of innate ability, probably because of our IQ, the genetics, whatever genes we acquired from our parents. And this is why you find that in most families, you find that uh, we could have a family of pilots, yeah? We could have a family of doctors and nurses. At times you have families whereby almost everybody is a teacher, yeah? Then uh, we are also talking about talent. Most of the talents are inborn. And uh, we know that especially for the, t uh, for the rare talents, talents are really paying. T talents are paying very well. Then you are talking about schooling. Where did you go to school? Which environment nurtured you to be where you are academically? Who were you inter interacting with uh, during uh, your schooling? Yes. Uh, like for example, now the level of the school, uh, like uh, from... Uh, what age were you introduced to technology? We are having very small children being able to operate laptops, being able to operate uh, our phones, yet there are others, depending on probably the location and exposure, who are not able uh, to know how they even operate. Then we are talking about training. Where did you train? Where did you train? We know that the institutions which are known to be very good in training in some certain careers, yeah, and um, 
they are equipped with the technology, with the machines, with the best, you know, professionals. They only employ the best. So you find that uh, if you get somebody who is a cheap from such uh, institutions, you bring the best in your organization. Then uh, we are also talking about school quality and non-schooling investments. Yeah, schooling quality and non-schooling investments. Like for example, there are so many students who enroll their students. Like for example, now students are at, at home. But in most families, especially who can afford, you find that uh, their children are still continuing with, uh, with education training at home. Uh, and especially training on talent, training on, uh, like for example, business abilities, especially if you are born in a uh, family uh, which does business or which transacts dif uh, businesses in different forms, such that by the time they are done with the school, they are already seasoned to be good uh, or uh, quality business uh, men uh, and women. So uh, we are also having a human capital investment, which is related to uh, the schooling, training, and all that. And uh, we are saying that uh, education is an investment. In labor economics, we try to look at uh, what can make us better, what can make us sell. And that is why we are finding that uh, you are getting people who are 50 years old going back for a master's, yeah? going back for a PhD, because what are they looking at? They are looking at their retirement package. They are saying, now I have a diploma. I'll be retiring in the next five years. I want to retire with a better, with a better retirement package. So if I retire with a diploma, I will not retire with good money. So why can't I utilize the next five years when I'm at work? Because I can still pay for myself to enroll for a degree, and I'll have graduated so that I graduate with a with a degree to have a quality uh, pension, um, pension package. So uh, we are saying like that uh, the reasons why most of us are investing our in, uh, in ourselves academically through training and education is because we are looking into the future whereby we want to see our future being uh, greener than uh, the way it is now. So human capital investment, a basic uh, model. So like any other investment, um, in human capital entails costs that are born in the near term with expectations that the benefits will accrue in future. Generally speaking, we can divide the cost of adding to human capital into three categories. Even when uh, we are working, I said some of us are still coming back to school and they are really trying to sacrifice a lot. Like for example, you find that uh, some money which they could have invested in a plot or something, they are paying fees with the hope that uh, in the near future they will be able to get promotion or a, a better job and they will not only be able to uh, get back the money which they paid as a uh, fees, but they will get much more to even be able to compensate uh, for the investments which they would have made during the time uh, when they have been uh, in school. Then we are also talking about uh, the sacrifices which we make when we are investing in ourselves uh, as human capital is whereby now you have foregone earnings. Like for example, when you are studying and uh, probably your lecturer, you may not get time to go for part-time uh, work in other universities or even within uh, your university because you want to invest a lot of time uh, to study. So you find that uh, those will be foregone earnings. But you are investing in education. You are uh, bearing the cost of education because of a greener returns in the near future after you're done. And then you are saying we also sacrifice a lot because uh, learning and training at times is tedious, it's difficult, especially for us when we are old, uh, ETC. So reasons why employees invest uh, in human capital. 
why do we invest in education? One, hope for a better future, improved salary, as I've said, promotion, job satisfaction, career growth, uh, ETC. Why do we earn different salaries? And uh, if you want to earn a good salary, what are you supposed to do? Like, for example, you find that those with higher education are likely to earn more. The nature of work, especially the work which requires a lot of skill, uh, a lot of uh, knowledge, uh, will require uh, maybe paid more. For those who have spent more years schooling, like doctors, engineers, pilots, etc., uh, are compensated for those very many years. We also, uh, by being paid better, sensitivity of the job, we talked about the surgeon. The other thing is about the financial mass of the organization to pay because an organization cannot pay which it doesn't have. Then we have strength of uh, the strength of uh, the trade unions. If you are uh, your trade union uh, as a strong bargaining mass, so then you are likely to be paid more. We've talked about talent. Rare talents attract. Uh, a lot of uh, money. So as we finish, we are asking ourselves, what are the benefits of studying labor economics? One, it helps us to be able to keep the right number of employees at the workplace without over employment. Uh, it also helps us to be able now to search our organization, do a survey and know that uh, not the employees who we need to downsize or to redundant because their skills are no longer relevant. Uh, it also informs us on uh, more skilling to avoid employing more people when we can utilize the ones which we have. Uh, it also enables us to be able, it informs us to use other cheaper sources of uh, human capital, like for example using students on uh, industrial placement, interns, outsourcing uh, because these uh, lead to reduction uh, in cost. It also educates us on uh, issues to do with the labor markets and the requirements uh, from the government, especially in taxes and uh, expenses. Um, it also informs us on how to pay as per the labor laws, uh, the quantity, quality of work done and expertise involved. Uh, I'm uh, leaving you with uh, a few questions on uh, chapter 3, which was on uh, the supply for labor. Uh, when we will be meeting in next class, you're supposed to have revised chapter 3 and be able to explain the following. Number one, why can our workers budget constraint for leisure and all other goods only pivot around one end? Because we know that uh, a time comes when an employee decides whether they are going to sacrifice on leisure yeah, and work so that they increase on their income, or whether they are going to sacrifice on their income yeah, and then work more. When the salary is uh, low, you work more so that you are able to make ends uh, meet. But if uh, you are earning more within less time, you may decide to have more of leisure and less of work. Then number two, how does a de decrease in wage affect workers' decision between leisure and labor? How does a decrease in wage when the salary is low affect a worker's decision between leisure and labor? Are you going to rest more or you are going to work more within uh, the hours which are stipulated uh, as working hours within a day? Then uh, what set of circumstances would generate a backward bending labor supply curve? Because a time comes when you feel that uh, you have gotten to maybe the level where you wanted in terms of income and you decide to reduce the hours which you work and have uh, more of uh, leisure. And then number five, what happens to labor supply if the wage increases and the labor supply curve is backward uh, bending? 
So current issues facing labor economics, we are talking about the unemployment, paying and retaining of talent. We are also talking about market competition. Uh, another challenge is uh, power, strength of trade unions in determining wages, whereby they have organizations and tied, especially where the trade union is very strong. Uh, then we are also having a challenge with the labor laws and the minimum wage, which organizations have to comply with. Then uh, we are also having a problem with the seasonality nature of some jobs, and specifically number six, COVID-19 pandemic and its mitigation measures, forcing only a few employees to be at work at a particular time is affecting production, not only in the short run, but also uh, in uh, the long run. I want to believe that uh, with all that, we may not have said much because uh, labor economics units has got many graphs to be drawn, to be explained to, but I chose to cover more of, uh, on the overview of the course unit. The next time we are going to think deeper chapter per chapter so that we understand more. But as of now, when you'll be re uh, revising on your own, you are not going to be as green as you were before we started this lecture. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank <laughs> you.